Hello, my name is Sophia Jochem. I'm a PhD student at Freie Universität Berlin in Germany, and my paper today is called Fungi and the City, Dickens' Urban Aesthetic of Decay. Great Expectations comes close to ending in its 21st chapter. On the day of his arrival in London, Pip finds himself waiting outside Herbert's chambers in Barnard's Inn. I opened the staircase window, Pip remembers, and had nearly beheaded myself, for the lines had rotted away and it came down like the guillotine. Whilst the comparison with the guillotine recalls the adrenaline of Dickens' previous novel, A Tale of Two Cities, this strange occurrence also echoes the reference to Damocles in one of the last illustrations to Little Dorrit, which shows the Clenham house just moments before it collapses. In the story, Damocles is taught a lesson by his king Dionysius. Offered to sit on his throne for one day, Damocles finds a sword suspended above it. The king has committed many injustices to gain his power and fortune, and the sword represents his constant fear of being ousted by those he has wronged. When the Clenham house crashes down like the sword, it kills two birds with one stone. The blackmailer Rigo, who dies in the accident, has had it coming. More powerfully, the collapse of the Clenham house manifests the ruin of Mrs. Clenham, who had enriched herself through fraud, false imprisonment and colonial trade. Of course, Pip's expectations are also tainted with a trans-imperial secret that will soon revenge itself. The window crashing down before Pip can even put his head out is a warning shot. But I don't think it's aimed at Pip specifically. The unjust means by which Pip has come to his fortune bear uncommonly sensational consequences, but otherwise they are pretty typical of the kind of people living at Barnard's. In the words of Raymond Williams, much of the trade of the world was carried and serviced by Britain, from its dominant position in shipping, banking and insurance, the new city of London. Even kind-hearted Herbert pursues a career as a capitalist, an insurer of ships, with a little in the mining way, perhaps, and more than a little in the trading way, to the East Indies for silks, shawls, spices, dyes, drugs and precious woods, and to the West Indies for sugar, tobacco and rum, also to Ceylon, especially for elephants' tusks. Herbert is into colonial capitalism, into the profits that can be made on other people's resources and enslaved Africans' labour. Sugar from the West Indies was notoriously slave-grown. Barnard's, a stepping stone into the city at the heart of British colonial development, bears its unmistakable stamp. Dry rot and wet rot and all the silent rots that rot in neglected roof and cellar, rot of rat and mouse and bug and coaching stables near at hand besides, address themselves faintly to my sense of smell and moaned, try Barnard's mixture. Barnard's is musty, Herbert concedes. In other words, the place reeks of corruption. Rot had served as a figure of moral degeneration for centuries. A famous example is Marcellus's observation that something is rotten in the state of Denmark in Hamlet, which great expectations he staged to immensely playful effect starring Mr. Wopsall. What interests me here is that, whereas Marcellus is speaking metaphorically, Dickens is speaking literally too. The staircase window that almost decapitates Pip derives its figural force from the presence of an actual fungus that has decomposed the lines both to hold the window up. Dickens doesn't simply literalise the rot, however. His fungal passages chart a revolution in the understanding of decay that invested rottenness with powerful new possibilities. In the West, up until the early 19th century, the decomposition of timber and plants was considered to be caused by, quote, internal disorganization of the nutrition processes, end quote. Fungi, if recognized at all, 
were believed to merely prey on decayed or decaying matter. A new paradigm slowly began to develop in the emerging field of mycology. One of the key figures here is the Reverend Miles Joseph Berkeley. In 1846, Berkeley confirmed an opinion that had been floated in several no local newspapers across Europe, that the potato murren, making the 1840s the hungry 40s, was caused by a fungus rather than by electricity in the air or potatoes' ultimate unsuitability for propagation by means of tubers, to mention only two of many rival explanations. Berkeley soon became the main proponent of what was often derisively referred to as the fungal theory, arguing steadfastly that the decay is the consequence of the presence of the mould and not the mould of the decay, even as this proposition was discredited as unacceptable and incomprehensible by a number of distinguished botanists, Berkeley managed to continually gain ground. Berkeley was wrong. Uh, DNA analysis has shown that Phytophthora infestans is not a fungus. In fact, fungi are more closely related to humans than to Phytophthora. But phylogenetics aside, Berkeley's tireless championing of the fungal theory laid the groundwork for a revolution in the conception of the nature of disease, not only in plants, but ultimately in all living things, as E.C. Large put it in his 1940 book, The Advance of the Fungi. This new understanding of the disease eventually equipped growers with means for regaining control over their crops, and incontrovertibly demonstrated the significance of the study of fungi. It's very unlikely that Dickens did not hear about the fungal nature of the potato murren, which was hotly debated in the press. He certainly got a refresher in mycology in the autumn of 1859, when all the year round ran two articles on fungi, good and bad fungus on August 6th, and fairy rings attributed to Eliza Lynn Linton on September 3rd, both of which quote Berkeley's work. In fact, Dickens, like many of his characters, is a competent urban forager, and outlines of Dickensian mycology would include, under the genus Muca alone, M. odoratus, pecksniff, or smelly mould. On damaged oranges, London thrives on fruit festering in boxes, as well as stored in damp cellars. There's a blue and a green variety. The fragrance of this mould is characteristic of the neighbourhood of Todgers. M. destitutius pip, or betrayal mould, on rotting bride cake, Rochester, Kent, black, populated with speckled-legged spiders. And M. hippocrisis, clenum, or hypocritical mould, on rotting residue of wine, London, furry, growing preferably in the throats of empty wine bottles. These specimens, like all fungi I have come across in Dickens so far, are saprotrophic rather than parasitic, that is, they decompose matter that is already dead rather than attacking live organisms. Fungi pop up in Dickens very much as they pop up in your fridge, on things that have gone out of date, in the widest sense of the word. Fungi grow in unsold or damaged oranges, but mostly they appear where people are behind the times. Stopping the clocks does not stop time, nor does it preserve wedding cake. Mrs. Glennon's old-fashioned religious doctrines, too, have clearly gone off. Her wine, Jesus' blood of the covenant, has been fully decomposed. And in Bleak House, the outdated system of the Court of Chancery stamps houses all over England with the same seal, a fungal seal, of stone steps turning stagnant green and the very crutches on which the ruins are propped decaying. Dickens' urban fungi don't just highlight anachrony, though. They decompose it. Fungi perform an important office in the economy of nature, Berkeley explains in his 1860 Outlines of British Fungology. By their fermentative and putrefactive powers, as well as their living so often at the expense of the hardest vegetable structure which they tend to decompose, they prepare a rich supply of vegetable mould for future generations. 
besides destroying those structures which have already performed their functions and are merely cumbering the surface of the earth. For things to move forward as they do on this planet, some things of the past must yield. Dickens' Ab and Fungi bring about renewal that is similarly radical. For Arthur and Amy to be able to go, quote, quietly down into the roaring streets, inseparable and blessed, end quote, and live a life of their own at the end of Little Dorrit, the old house cumbering the surface of the earth with an earlier generation's guilty secrets must be razed to the ground. Its foundations having yielded long ago, the Clenham house is leaning on some half-dozen gigantic crutches which, weather-stained, smoke-blackened and overgrown with weeds, appeared in these latter days to be no very sure reliance. The weeds growing on the wooden crutches likely refer specifically to the mycelium, the thread-like vegetative part, of Sopula lacrimans, or dry rot, which appears to have been called a weed quite commonly. Dry rot, which is incidentally believed to have made its way to Europe as a stowaway on colonial trading ships, was notorious. In Fairy Rings, Lynn Linton calls it one of the greatest enemies of our fleet, and the architect John Patworth introduces his 1803 essay on the causes of the dry rot in buildings by noting that, to those whose property is very extensive, the enormous amount of annual repairs exhibits a melancholy testimony of its devastative principle. The truth is, the author of some observations on that distemper in timber called the dry rot explains, the timber is gone before the fungus makes it, its visible appearance. The rot is incurable by any method with which we are now acquainted. Sopula lacrimans, then, is a sign of irremediable corruption. And so it is clear from the outset of Little Dorrit that the Clenham house cannot or must not be saved. The houses making up Tom all alone's in Bleak House, which are all in chancery, are likewise going one after the other with, quote, a crash and a cloud of dust, end quote. The same fate awaits Martha's squalid lodgings in David Copperfield, which show unmistakable signs of another Dickensian species, Serpula agistatis, Copperfield, or poverty rot, on aged, damp, dark wood, London, weakens the flooring in the lodgings of the poor to an extent that renders it unsound and even unsafe. Barnard's Inn, too, smells like it'll be ready to go rather sooner than later. Foraging for fungi in Dickens takes one on a tour of London at its worst, a city hopelessly entangled in archaic evils seemingly incompatible with Dickens' idea of civilised society. From colonial trade and slave-grown commodities to unregulated slum housing. Civilization turns out to be fundamentally rotten, fungus growths highlighting its injustices with a pungent urgency. At the same time, Dickens' Urban Fungi sketch out an alternative way of relating to the past, which Caitlin de Silvey, taking inspiration from Papua New Guinean perishable monuments called Malangan, terms a, quote, ecology of memory, end quote. Here, remembering proceeds not through reflection on a static memorial remnant, but on the process that slowly pulls the remnant into other ecologies and expressions of value, accommodating simultaneous resonances of death and rebirth, loss and renewal. Dickens' urban fungi, a testament to the fact that the moment we inhabit is only one moment in a constant intraspecies circle of growth and decay thus entangling the social economies of Dickens' city writing in the economy of nature, as Berkeley put it. Dickens' fungi suggests that even in 19th century London, humanity has not wholly conquered nature, on the contrary. The metropole turns out to be fungus, in a sense of the word that went obsolete during Berkeley's lifetime. Like the fruiting body of a fungus, it has grown with wonderful rapidity, but ultimately it is also like the fruiting body of a fungus, ephemeral, and will be gone again the next moment. Thank you.